Welcome to Book Plug. Wing Commander Muriel Volstrangler, FRHS and Bar, has recently published her book The Golden Skits, and we have some of the skits with us here in the studio. She was born in Beckles in 1919 and has had a fairly variegated career, including spells as a wasp farmer in Kenya, a freelance probationary officer, the RAF, and six weeks breaking in hats for T.S. Eliot. Her first collection of verse, That's for Starters, was based on her wartime experience bombing Dresden. The wing commander retired in 1984 after being poisoned by a kipper in Glastonbury. She now divides her time between Lowestoft and Nicosia, and she's on the line to us there now. Uh, hello, wing commander. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you can you hear me all right, wing commander? Yes, I can. Um, excuse me a moment. Please get off the line, Angela. Hello, this is Sue McGregor. No, no, I was talking to Angela this end. She's on the extension. Ah, that's better. I'm so sorry, Sue. We're very pleased to have you on the programme with us. And welcome to you too, dear. Now, Wing Commander, most of us know about your war exploits as a pilot. You were perhaps the aviatrix par excellence of your generation, and your part in the bombing of Dresden is almost legendary. Oh, really? It was nothing. Uh, excuse me. Angela, I'm talking to Sue McTavish. There's no need to get like that. She's with the BBC. I'm so sorry. No, not at all. Then there was that other, perhaps less happy exploit when you bombed Western Supermare in 1951. Was that perhaps an accident? I'm very glad you asked me that, Sue. Um... Hello? Uh, hello? I, I'm afraid we seem to have lost the wing commander for the moment. So perhaps we'd better have a skit called... This one, the slightly less silly courtroom skit. The lad in this case, my learned friend, Mr. Mel Travers, appears for the defence, and I appear for the money. <laughs> the, case... <laughs> the case would appear to be a simple one, my lord. The prosecution will endeavour to prove that the snivelling, depraved, cowardly wretch whom you see cowering before you returned home on the night of the 14th of July in a particularly vicious and unpleasant frame of mind had words with his wife and then deliberately assaulted his pet ostrich by throwing a watering can at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a watering can, my lad. Uh, a watering can, a large um, cylindrical tin-plated vessel with a perforated pouring piece much used by the lower classes for the purpose of artificially moistening the surface soil. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Your knowledge is inexhaustible. You are very gracious, my lad, if I may continue. Uh, the ostrich... <laughs> The ostrich, my lad, an ostrich, a large, hairy, flightless bird, resident in Africa, remarkable for its speed in running and much prized for its feathers. Uh, a, a kind of kookaburra. No, my lad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ostrich, taking fright, flew out of the window and landed on a passing ice cream cart. Oh, there that cart? Ice cream cart, my lad. Ice cream, uh, an artificial cream substitute, originally invented by the American Indians as an antidote to trench foot. <laughs> Oh, thank you, my lad, if I may be allowed to continue. And landed on a passing ice cream cart, thereby causing a small dollop of oh, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I beg your pardon, my lad. I'm afraid I was trying to clear my throat. Um, thereby causing a small, uh, small portion of ice cream to fall on the plaintiff, Mr. Sidney Buttle, a dwarf, who was hopping past at the time, <laughs> thereby soiling Mr. Buttle's new suit. Those, quite simply, are the facts of the case, my lad. A very straightforward one, as I think we will all agree. It would appear that the rule laid down in Pritchard against the East Halifax Fishbone Glue Manufacturing Company would apply. Uh, was that the case of the slug and the lemonade bottle, Mr. Parker? Uh, no, my lad. It was the case of the human cannonball and the kiwi. Ah, that was the kookaburra. No, my lad. I think his lordship is thinking of white against Phillips, Mr. Parker, in the case Perfect of the right, aborigine yes. who was about to launch his boomerang at a dingo that was chasing his kangaroo, had his attention distracted by a lunging kookaburra, causing him to release the boomerang which struck a passing cobber in the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> An Australian case, my lad. Hello? I think we've got the Wing Commander back on the line now. Can you hear me, Wing Commander? Yes, I can, Sue. Just, uh, excuse me a moment. Angela, please don't use the Hoover now. No, she is not a new friend, as you put it. She's a BBC interviewer. Hello, Sue. Hello. 
Uh, I just wanted to say about the uh, Western Supermare incident, it was not a bomb, as was reported in some papers. It all happened on a test run of the then new Filton Volstrangler Mark I, and you see, as I banked left hard over Western, the, uh, the chief steward, who was leaning against an unsuspected weak point in the fuselage, uh, fell through, and for some reason, when he hit the ground, he exploded. Exploded? Yes. Well, he was a very tense man at the best of times, and he had marital problems during that period as well, and he was rather apprehensive about the maiden flight too. And obviously he tightened up even more on the way down. So the splinters from him did a lot of damage, but it was a person, although a lot of people nearby quite reasonably assumed otherwise. And that's why the town hall used to have that distressed finish. Wing Commander, of all your many achievements, is flying the most important to you? My first love, really. You see, when I was six... Angela, I'm talking about flying! Please! Press the olives. I'm sorry, where was I? What I wanted to ask you is, your writing is clearly very important to you, yet your flying must have occupied a great deal of your time. And I wonder, has there ever been a conflict between the two interests? Oh, yes. As a pilot and writer, one's always struggling with that one. I remember, for example, uh, Dresden, zero hour minus ten seconds, just swooping down over the Bergerstrasse, ready to drop a few chief stewards, as we used to call them, onto the heads of the snoozing Kraut citizenry, and lo and behold, a cracking idea for a skit pops into the old cranium. What an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. Lose the idea or spare the porcelain factories. So what happened? Well, fortunately, I'm ambidextrous, so I was able to get the gist of the idea down on the back of a player's weights packet with one hand while letting Dresden have it where it hurts with the other. But it's it's constantly a recurring conflict that, as a writer... And a pilot. And as a pilot, one has to face almost daily. And what was the skit? The bookshop skit. Uh, good morning. Can you help me? Uh, do you have a copy of 30 Days in the Samarkand Desert with a Spoon by A.E.J. Elliott? Uh, well, we haven't got it in stock, sir. Uh, how about 101 Ways to Start a Monsoon? By... Uh, an Indian gentleman whose name eludes me for the moment. Well, I don't know the book, sir. Uh, not to worry, not to worry. Can you help me with David Copperfield? Ah, yes. Dickens. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Edmund Wells. I think you'll find Charles Dickens wrote David Copperfield. Uh, no, Charles Dickens wrote David Copperfield with two P's. This is David Copperfield with one P by Edmund Wells. Oh, well, in that case, we don't have it. <laughs> oh. uh, funny, you've got a lot of books here. Yes, we do have quite a lot of books yes. here. We don't have David Copperfield with one P by Edmund Wells. We only have David Copperfield with two P's by Charles Dickens. Pity, it's more thorough than the Dickens. More thorough? Yes, I wonder if it's worth having a look for no, your no, David I, Copperfield. I'm quite sure got... that all our David Copperfields have two P's. But how about Great Expectations? Ah, yes, we have that. That's G-R-A-T-E, Expectations. <laughs> also by Edmund Wells. Well, in that case, we don't have it. We don't have anything by Edmund Wells, actually. He's not very popular. Uh, not Nicholas Nickleby? That's K-N-I-C-K-E-R, Nicholas. No. Or uh, Christmas Carol with a Q? No, definitely not. <laughs> Sorry to trouble you. Not at all. I wonder if you have a copy of Barnaby Budge. No, as I say, we're right out of Edmund Wells. Uh, no, not Edmund Wells, Charles Dickens. <laughs> Charles Dickens? Yes. You mean Barnaby Rudge? Uh, no, Barnaby Budge by Charles Dickens. That's Dickens with two Ks, the well-known Dutch author. No, no, we don't have Barnaby Budge by Charles Dickens with two Ks, the well-known Dutch author. And perhaps to save time, I should add, right, away that we don't have Carnaby Fudge by Dahl's Tickens or Stickwick Stapers by Miles Pickens with four M's and a silent Q. Why don't you try the chemist? I have. They sent me here. Did they? Yeah. I wonder if you have the amazing adventures of Captain Gladys Stoke pamphlet and her intrepid spaniel Stig among the giant pygmies of Corsica, volume two. No, no, we don't have that one. Funny, we've got quite a lot of books here. Yes, haven't you? Well, I mustn't keep you standing around all day chatting. You know. No, no, we haven't. Well, no. well we're well, closing well, for lunch well, now. Well, I thought I saw it over there. Where? Over there. What? Olsen's Standard Book of British Birds. Olsen's Standard Book of British Birds? Yes. O-L-S-E-N? Yes. B-I-R-D-S? Yes. Yes, well, we do have that one. The expurgated version, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. The expurgated version. The expurgated version of Olsen's Standard Book of British Birds? Yes, the one without the gannet. The one without the gannet? But well, they've all got the gannet. It's a standard British bird, the gannet. It's in all the books. Well, I don't like them. Long, nasty beaks. But it, you can't expect them to produce a special edition for gannet haters. Well, I'm sorry. I especially want the one without the gannet. All right. 
Anything else? And I'm not too keen on robins. Right, robins, robins, robins. <laughs> no gannets, no robins. There's your book. I can't buy that. It's torn. <laughs> it's torn. So it is. I wonder if you've got... Go on, ask me another. We've got lots of books here. This is a bookshop, you know. How about Biggles combs his hair? No, 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 you don't have that one. No, no, funny. Try me again. Have you got Ethel the Aardvark goes quantity surveying? No, 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 we haven't. Which one? Ethel the Aardvark goes quantity surveying. <laughs> Ethel the Aardvark? <laughs> I've seen it. We've got it. We've got it somewhere. Ethel the Aardvark. Yes! Yeah! Yeah! Ethel the Aardvark goes quantity surveying. There! Now, buy it. I haven't got enough money on me. I'll take a deposit. I haven't got any money on me. I'll take a check. I don't have a bank account. <laughs> right. I'll buy it for you. <laughs> there we are. There's your change. That's for that taxi on the way home. Wait, right, wait, 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 wait. What? 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 I can't read. <laughs> you can't read? No. <laughs> right. Sit. <laughs> Wing Commander, since being so unfortunately poisoned by a kipper in Glastonbury, you've given up flying to devote yourself to writing and the olive groves. But of course you had a brief spell in between as Libyan Foreign Minister. Uh, well, they were a little short on geography graduates at the time, so I was only too pleased to help out. Fascinating. Uh, you were the first woman ever to hold a position in the Libyan cabinet. That's quite correct, Sue. And, of course, if they'd ever realised, there could have been trouble. But it was indeed fascinating, and I enjoyed the chanting hugely. Were you able to write at all during this time? Yes, um, mainly during the cabinet meetings, in fact, because the chanting's very easy to pick up, and then you can get on with some real work while you're all at it. Didn't you feel, though, that there was danger that the other cabinet ministers would notice you were writing skits? Well, most of them were at it, too. Writing skits? Well, not only skits, uh, newspaper articles, uh, novels, recipes. Some of them used to assemble radio sets, almost anything to earn a little extra money. You see, under Libyan socialism, the professional classes earn about the same as those in the so-called dirty jobs, like dustmen or state assassins. And was it as a minister that you wrote the well-known Minister Falling to Pieces skit? That's very acute of you, Sue. Good evening, Minister. Good evening. Now, Minister, I believe you've been in Germany this past week studying new coal place methods. Do you think you've learned anything that could be of use to British coal production? Well, it's very difficult to say at this stage, but it does begin to look... <laughs> Good heavens, my foot's dropped off. <laughs> it's gone to sleep. No, it's dropped off. It's fallen on the floor. Look. <laughs> Here it is, under the table. It, it, it fell off. <laughs> So it has. Uh, will it screw back on again? Of course it won't screw back on. Your foot doesn't screw on, does it? Uh, could we have the camera round on the minister? Get the bloody point? camera away from my foot! I don't want people staring at it. No, uh, minister, um, how did it uh, drop off? I don't know. It's never happened before. It doesn't... Hang on! Ah! There goes the other one. My feet have dropped off. Both of them. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Could I have some sticky tape, please? Oh! Oh, and a box. Oh, uh, Minister, oh, why are you... Oh, going back to Germany. Why oh, my thigh! My thigh's fallen off. Uh, Minister, um, is this your knee? Of course it's my knee. Who's to think it is? Uh, Put it in the box. Why you were in Germany, did you? Oh, oh, oh. Put me in the box. For God's sake, don't lose any of the bits. So, um, may I just say, the idea for that skit came from something that actually happened one evening to dear old Gaddafi. Really? Could you tell us a little about your life nowadays in Nicosia? Well, there's plenty to do. Um, I'm very fortunate in having retained the services of my batman Angela, or that person, I should say, sorry. And uh, Angela sees to the routine work, um, picking and bottling the olives, culling the wasps, and dealing with the press. She's absolutely wonderful. I don't know what I'd do without her. She, she's a brick. One of the Worcestershire bricks, incidentally. So Ms Brick runs the estate, leaving you free to write? Exactly. You see, as a writer, ex-pilot and olive producer, one does need some help, and Angela provides that, so that the writing can... I am not patronising you. There is nothing wrong with saying you help me. Now do the olives. Angela, don't do... We seem to have lost Nicosia for a moment, so perhaps we'd better have another skit. Sit down, sit down, 18. Sit down, sit, sit. 
It's your last warning, 18. Next time I strap you in. <laughs> My eight hours in the coach and you're hysterical. What are you going to be like in three days? Pull yourself together, man. You've only seen five capitals. You've got another 18 to go. Right, wake up, 12. Wake up. Now, in 20 minutes, we will be leaving Italy and entering Switzerland, which is a different country. So finish your spaghetti, throw the cans out of the window, and put the primer stoves back under your seats. You may now open your souvenir plastic bags marked not to be opened till Italy. You'll find a small green plastic replica of the Tower of Pisa. Don't try and stand it up, it's made that way. <laughs> now, in half a minute, we'll be crossing the border. You don't need your passports here. We've got a special arrangement. They just stamp the coach. <laughs> We're in Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is famous for its mountains, cheese, clocks, and chocolate, nothing else. Open your plastic bags, mark Switzerland, and you'll find a small piece of chocolate. Eat it up quickly, we're not here long, it's a small country. <laughs> right now, wake up, 12, wake up. There's another capital coming up in a moment, I warned you all before. If you miss a capital, you do the whole tour again. Now, burn, B-E-R-N-E, burn is coming up on the right-hand side of the coach in a moment. Sorry, it's getting a bit dark, shine your torches out of the window. <laughs> there it is, over there, right, tick burn. Now, burn is the sixth, you missed that, didn't you, nine? <laughs> What do you mean you can't find a chocolate nine? No excuses, you Mr. Capital. Right, that's number nine, Thompson. You'll do the tour again. Stop screaming. Stop screaming. Hold him up someone. Never mind, he's fainted. All right, we'll have an emergency stop here. Please stop everyone out, 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 out. In, 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 in. Everybody back in. You will last 22. You'll watch the coach. Right. We're off again right now. The midnight bathe in the crystal clear waters of the Swiss lake as referred to in the brochure. The coach will be passing through the lake in 30 seconds. Get your swimming costumes on now. <laughs> Open the doors, driver. This is where I leave you. There's another courier waiting for you on the other side of the lake. Breathe in when I say breathe in. Breathe in. Good luck. Goodbye. No drowning. <laughs> Ah, oh, now, I think we're back in contact with Nicosia again. Wing Commander, you've travelled a great deal. Do you have a favourite country or place? Colorado. And this is where you worked as a cocktail waitress at a crematorium, I believe. That's right, yes, Sue, at Big Jack's Barbecue Resting Ground. It was a brief but most rewarding experience. And were you there primarily to get ideas for your skits? Well, frankly, Sue, one doesn't choose to serve martinis and Harvey wallbangers to the recently bereaved simply in order to amass funny material. That would be, for me, abusing one's position. No, Sue, it was because I've always been fascinated by death, and I wanted to have the chance to learn more about it, and indeed to help in any way I was able. And how did you find that you could help? Well, Sue, you see, mourners are very often rather listless and sometimes a little, well, to put it bluntly, depressed. And... I found one could do an awful lot with a smile or a cheery word or an Irish joke or a slap on the back, a bit of repartee, or even a little practical joke, a plastic spider in the cocktail, uh, India rubber pretzels, uh, whoopee cushions on the pews, anything just to snap them out of it. And many's the time in a room full of sombre strangers I've been the only one giggling and joshing people and behaving naturally. How long did you work there? Only three weeks. The hours were good, but we worked for tips, and mine were, frankly, rather disappointing. Now, as an ex-wasp farmer in Kenya, Wing Commander, you must look back on that time with particular relish. Indeed, yes. To be truthful, I originally went to Kenya to recover from an unhappy affair of the heart, but having arrived in East Africa, the wasps quite literally took over. They're such wonderfully warm little creatures, you know, and it was just one of those happy turning points. You felt really at ease with them. Very much so. People think of wasps as cantankerous and not to be trusted, in a word, but all a wasp needs is eye contact. Just a few seconds, and it's yours for life. You, you hold their gaze, and that's all the reassurance they need. After all, so just think how we've treated them for literally hundreds of years, a, a tiny striped sightseer cruises into a room, the women start screaming or going catatonic, the men start creeping about, hissing orders and rolling up newspapers, dogs bark, and then the flack really starts flying and all our little friend wanted was three molecules of marmalade, so it's hardly surprising that sometimes they overreact. How many wasps did you have altogether? I had 87, Sue. 87? Good heavens. Yes. And was the farm a success? In all ways other than purely financially, yes, but that's why, in the end, I had to return to England. I see. Now, you mentioned earlier, Wing Commander, that you'd had an unhappy relationship in England. I wonder, are you able to tell us a little about that? Well, Nigel Nicholson got it more or less right. I was very deeply involved with a wonderful, romantic, insane, tempestuous Russian. 
a spy? Yes, and widely recognised as a very, very fine one. But... Well, I was young, and I just hadn't realised what a two-faced blighter a KGB agent could be. Especially when he's running MI5? Quite, yes. Did you know that at the time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But you never told the security services? Well, we all assumed they knew. I mean, everyone else did, you see. And after the breakup with Boris, you wrote this skit. Ah, oh, I'd love to be alone in the country. John? Yes? I'm with you. <laughs> I'd love to be alone in the country. Oh, John, why don't you admit it? You... you don't love me anymore. All right, I admit it. <laughs> John, once we had something that was pure and wonderful and, and, and good. What's happened to it? You spent it all. <laughs> to you, isn't it? Money. I despise you. Do you hear me? I hate you. I don't know how I've been able to stand it. I, I, I suppose it's because I love you. I don't know. I do love you, John. I, I love you more than I can say. I, I need you, John. I, please, John, don't look at photographs of nude women while I'm talking to you. <laughs> oh, all right, but, uh... John. What's happening to us? I know you know. You know? Yes. <laughs> John? Yes? What do you know? Well, I could be wrong. You mean about me and Nigel? Oh, 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 I was wrong. <laughs> uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was Rupert. You're right, it is Rupert. I can never remember names. <laughs> anyway, I do know about last Friday. Last Friday? Yes. He was in my bed, wasn't he? How did you know? He kept pushing me out. <laughs> you mean you were there too? You didn't even notice. Please, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, it's too painful. Personally or professionally? Both. So you never married? No, no. But your companion, Angela Brick, lives with you in Nicosia and in Lowestoft. Yes, that's right, Sue. Angela likes it here, and she travels with me, too. Not that we are particularly close, of course. We... Oh! You cow! You cow! Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I just ricked my back. Well, while you recover, let's have the theatre basket. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever seen when, when that chap came in through the door. <laughs> it's Sergeant Gittins with the tiger's head. <laughs> oh, it does you good to have a good laugh once uh, in a while. Let me uh, get you a drink. What do you want? <coughs> uh, gin and tonic, please. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, Rupert. <laughs> hello. Oh, hello. Oh, nice to see you. I haven't seen you for years. Oh, you're, uh, Celia, darling, this is Malcolm Kerr. Uh, Malcolm Cedar. Hello. Hello. I say it's a marvellous play, isn't it? It's terribly funny, isn't it? <laughs> you like it, do you? Oh, yes. I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty funny, isn't it? Funny? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, bits of it. You know. Don't you, uh... Yes, I suppose it's quite amusing, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, I don't think it's all that good. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but there are moments when, mm. you know... It's well, just... like the scene with the porter. Oh, the scene with the porter. That's uh, very funny. That's marvellous. Yeah. Wildly overdone. Oh, wildly overdone, yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it, you know, nevertheless, it quite had... Quite funny. Yeah, quite funny. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's quite funny, but uh, just a bit overdone, but quite funny. Mm. Except at the end. Except at the end, mm. yes. Uh, which is uh, a little more... Um, uh, well, it is a little more, uh, a little more, uh, what? Uh, well, I was going to say it is, uh, I mean, compared with the rest, it is uh, just a little more, uh, uh... Surrealist? Surrealist, yes, that's it, yes. Ah, yes. uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> no, not surrealist. No, I don't think so, not surrealist. No. <laughs> oh, ah, Paul, oh, yeah. uh, I want you to meet Rupert. Uh, Hello. Hello. Well, you were just discussing the play. Marvellous, isn't it? Yeah. I was just saying that, um... <laughs> We all agree that it is quite funny, uh, you know, in bits, bits. Bits of it? Mm -hmm. You said it was the funniest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yes. Did it? No, 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 I didn't, no, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I said the bit with the porter was very, well, it was wildly overdone. Overdone? What's so special about the porter bit? You were laughing at the whole thing. 
Well, I was, yes, yes, hardly, yes, in, uh, in bits, yes. I want other parts. Other parts. Yes. I like, well, uh... Now, come on. Come on. Now, you fell off your seat laughing at the fellow with the tiger skin. Did he? Did you <laughs> laugh at that? No, I didn't laugh at that. I didn't think... I didn't think that was at all up, uh, under the top. I thought that was over the... I didn't think that was funny. Oh, you are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was funny. You funny little idiot. Oh, I thought it was funny. Yes, Oh, that bit. Oh, yes, that bit. Yeah. Oh, yes, that was very funny. Yes, I did laugh at that. Yes, he did. <laughs> that was very funny. Well, it wasn't that funny. No, it wasn't that funny. It wasn't that funny. No, it was more, um, well, it was more humorous, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it's surrealism. I mean, over the... Uh, you've got a... Uh, that, uh, that's the phone. I, uh, I must go to the lavatory. <laughs> Does your, uh, does your friend go to the theatre often? Oh, yes. He's a critic. When you joined the RAF, Wing Commander, was it hard to get your wings as a woman? Hard? Well, of course it was hard. You're a woman, Sue. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody handed you that microphone on a plate, did they? You had to beg and plead and fawn and walk over people. You had to squabble to get where you are. Well, I, I'm not sure... I mean, none that... of the boys in blue treated me as an equal until that day I brought the Spitfire down with one wing and no engine in a Force 9 gale with a heavy ground fog that dreadful night in February. Of course, it was the boys who'd filed the wing off and spiked the petrol tank in the first place. Thank God I found the last blast over the goggles in time. I tackled them about it later. They said they felt a bit defensive because I was a woman. Defensive, I said. Defensive like Genghis Khan was defensive. Do you, do you think they meant any real harm? Well, you know what men ask you. Of course, others weren't so lucky. Thelma, for instance, was never heard of again. But then she wasn't as pretty as me. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for this week. I do apologise for the technical difficulties at the beginning. But next week, we hope to have the Wing Commander with us again at that time, with me, here in the studio. For policy reasons, I'm afraid it's not possible to tell you that the golden skits of Wing Commander Muriel Volstrangler is published by Methuen. Neither will it be possible to tell you after the second edition of Book Plug at the same time next week. Book Plug was introduced by Sue McGregor. Her guest this week was Wing Commander Muriel Volstrangler, FRHS and Barr. The script was by Claire Taylor. The skits by Muriel Volstrangler and Graham Chapman. The skitsters were David Hatch, Chris stewart Clark, Anthony Buffery, Marty Feldman, Graham Chapman, Tim Brooke Taylor, Terry Jones, Joe Kendall, Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett, Sheila Stiefel and John Cleese. The programme was produced by Jonathan James Moore. And it brings the time to five to one. And with the detailed weather forecast, here's Frank Green. Good afternoon. Some rain in many places today, but at least much of Britain is turning warmer. In the Channel Islands, South East England and East Anglia, cloudy early this afternoon.